are you a human to begin with, or are you an ecosystem? Because if 90% of the cells in your body are not human, then, you know, let's, let's really have an identity conversation about what we actually are. So uh, foundationally, only when the bottom of the food chain is functioning well, does the middle and the top of the food chain function well. And so it's about creating a dynamic where the microbiome is flourishing, where the bacteria and the fungi and the RKE and all the all those little people that you can't see that we don't even have names for or even know how many of them there are. Um, it's when they're happy, then everything else takes care of itself. You can think about the fact that plants have been growing for hundreds of millions of years without fertilizer and chemicals and farming things. And it's because nature evolved the system where there's a symbiotic relationship with the bacteria and the fungi and the plant and the plant makes sugar and it feeds the microbes and the microbes digest the soil and feed the plant. And it's, it's a beautiful symbiotic relationship. So, so that's to say, you know, there's a bunch of practices that can be utilized to facilitate that. Dieting, fasting, eliminating foods, and all the things is not the answer to health. The nutrient density of your food is your link to attaining and experiencing true health. Dan Kittredge is an organic farmer. He's also the founder of the Bionutrient Meter, which measures the nutrient density of food. It's open source and he's on a mission to help people understand that the nutrient density of food is not only our connection to our own personal health and well-being, but it's also a connection to the health of our planet, the health of our soil, the health of our earth. And our health starts in the foundation that is beneath our feet. It starts in the soil. In this conversation, we talk about what nutrient density actually means how farming impacts the nutrient density of food, why farmers need to care, and how we can increase the nutrient density of the food that we grow as a gardener and as a farmer. We also dive into how our food and the way it's grown awakens consciousness and awakens us to our higher senses, our higher self, and being able to see beyond what we can see with our eyes. Thank you so much for spending time with us here at Heart and Soil. Enjoy this conversation with Dan Kittredge. And if you know somebody who might enjoy learning about the nutrient density of food and how it impacts our health and the health of the planet, then please share this with a friend. You make yourself an amazing day. I'm Natalie Forstbauer, publisher and editor-in-chief of Heart and Soil magazine. Big love. Enjoy this conversation with Dan Kittredge. He's awesome. It's an honor to have this conversation with you today. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So hopefully, hopefully it's good. Yeah. <clears throat> it, it'll be amazing. Um, so Dan, what does nutrient density mean to you when you think about food or the way what it's growing? What does density mean to me? Um, well, I think it's the, it's the conversation about the quality of your food, the relative quality of your food. And, um, you know, we basically help to popularize this term to bring awareness to the fact that, um, you know, we know in common sense that a tomato out of the garden tastes different than a tomato out of the grocery store. But um, we don't necessarily logically understand that that flavor difference connects to a very significant nutritional difference. Um, and... Um, <clears throat> there is a significant variation of nutrient levels in food between this steak and that steak, between this milk and that milk, between this rice and that rice. Um, and so nutrient density is a term that sort of talks about that variation and helps people focus on the quality as opposed to the label or the marketing framework or the story or things like that. Um, so, yeah. And and why is it so important? Like, why is it important to consumers? First of all, why would they care about nutrient density in their food? Um, well, I mean, I mean, how many how many different ways? <laughs> That's about eight different ways. Uh, um, for starters, because you know you are what you eat, and if you build your body out of things that are of you know insufficient nutritional caliber, then you begin to degenerate to. Um, become ill, become susceptible to illness, develop chronic disease. Um, so for every person's basic level of function and vitality, it's critical to actually eat food of 
you know, good inherent nutritional caliber. And um, yeah, and if you've got children and you care about your children and they've got, you know, any kind of diseases or they're struggling with this or that, or, um, you know, I like to say, you know, um, kids are animals and, you know, an animal knows when something tastes good or doesn't. And so if you give a kid a carrot that may be organic, but doesn't taste good, the kid's gonna spit it out. Um, but if you get a, give a kid a carrot that tastes good, they'll eat it because they're an animal. And so if you actually want your kids to be healthier and eat their fruits and vegetables, um, giving them ones that taste good <laughs> will have a dramatic impact on that. Um, so that's, those are a couple of pieces, but there's also the, you know, very exciting connection to soil health and environmental system function and environmental toxicity or, you know, healing, um, you know, agriculture is a very, very significant, um, has a significant effect on the landscape, on the ecosystem, on the climate, et cetera. And um, it can either be a beneficial effect or a detrimental effect. And there's a direct connection between um, the health of the soil, the health of the environment, and the nutritional caliber of the food. As in, when the soil is healthier, the food has more nutrients in it, more nutrients per pound, et cetera, et cetera. It's more flavorful, it's better for you, and it's actually beneficial for the environment. So um, yeah, there's a couple of reasons there. I probably really? find more if you want. No, those are all really powerful because you linked us to so many spokes on the wheel. You linked us to the impact of nutrient density to our health and its connection to illness and disease, which um, is a, an epidemic in North America and actually in different parts around the world. And um, you linked it to uh, actually getting people to eat the fruits and vegetables, give them something that tastes good, right? I remember growing up at the farmer's market and um, well, actually not growing up at the farmer's market, but um, on the organic farm and then being at the farmer's market and little kids coming by and offering them carrots and cucumbers and beans and, and parents would be like, oh, they actually don't eat that. And we're yeah. like, well, just take it. Just let them take it. Just try it. Just try it. And then they turn around and come back. They're like, I'll take five pounds of those, Mike. You know, son has never eaten a carrot in his life. Never eaten fresh beans. What's going on? <laughs> yeah, yeah. They're good. They taste good when they're good. You know, it's not complicated. Yeah, it's so. Most people don't get access to them, though. You don't. You don't get that in the normal supply chain. It's really hard. Yeah, it's so true. And then you also connected it to um, the soil health and the impact on the environment. And I'm curious about um, how the how. Tell me more about the impact of the nutrient density of the food on the environment. Like, what's the link in that? Well, I mean, people know about this whole carbon thing in the atmosphere and, um, you know, that agriculture, um, as practiced, what we call now conventional ag, um, has, you know, depending on how back you want to look, tillage and things like that globally have caused, I think it's something like 40% of the land's surface to desertify. Mm -hmm. um, like that's a lot. <laughs> you know, there's big parts of the, of the of the planet that used to be green and now are brown, and it's because ag culture was practiced poorly there to some large degree. Um, and there are also parts of the planet that are now green that used to be brown because ag culture was practiced well there. So, um, you know, indigenous cultures you can look at globally across you know history and and different continents were really good at managing the ecosystem with a light touch to facilitate lots of food being produced and soil being built and ecosystem function happening at a high level. So mm -hmm. it's not that we as humans don't have the capacity to do work in harmony with nature and cause beneficial things to happen. It's just that the structures that we're currently operating out of, you know, are not um, <laughs> designed to or having the corollary effects of environment functioning well. So um, right. and yeah. would you would you summarize or agree with 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 this stand that it's um it's the use of agrochemicals and pesticides and um and inputs and massive amounts of tilling that is impacting that uh those are all certainly major factors absolutely yeah okay. I mean, it's really sort of insensitive engagement with the land mm -hmm. and, and then if we zoom out and so rather than talking about um and this is one of the things I like about you is um, you tend to really amplify what different practices do really well. And so rather than um, zoom in on what organics or biodynamics or 
um, Korean natural farming does or don't do well or do well individually, what collectively are we doing really well in the regenerative space to help re, um, regenerate the land and help increase the nutrient density of the food? And um, what can we as growers, both gardeners and farmers, keep in mind to help uh, increase the nutrient density of our food? What are the things that we can do well or are doing well or the common the common things across permaculture and agroecology and organics and you know regenerative that correlate with systems functioning well? Um, I for me it's it starts with an understanding that the bottom of the food chain needs to be happy before the middle of the food chain is happy, before the top of the food chain is happy. And so while you know in many cases farmers are thinking about maybe animals, but usually plants in some fashion, um, you know, both animals and plants have evolved. Um, you could argue have been evolved by microbes and, you know, 90 plus percent of our cells are not human, right? We think of ourselves as human. We have this identity conversations about gender and race and culture. And I'm like, yeah, well, it's, <laughs> are you a human to begin with, or are you an ecosystem? Because if 90% of the cells in your body are not human, then you know, let's let's really have an identity conversation about what we actually are. So, uh, foundationally, only when the bottom of the food chain is functioning well does the middle and the top of the food chain function well. And so, it's about creating a dynamic where the microbiome is flourishing, where the bacteria and the fungi and the RKE and all the all those little people that you can't see that we don't even have names for or even know how many of them there are. Um, it's when they're happy, then everything else takes care of itself. You can think about the fact that plants have been growing for hundreds of millions of years without fertilizer and chemicals and farming things. And it's because nature evolved the system where there's a symbiotic relationship with the bacteria and the fungi and the plant and the plant makes sugar and it feeds the microbes and the microbes digest the soil and feed the plant. And it's, it's a beautiful symbiotic relationship. So, so that's to say, you know, there's a bunch of practices that can be utilized to facilitate that. Um, maintaining soil cover is uh, foundational if you understand that your microbes need to be fed. Um, I like to say microbes don't fly off to January to Florida in January, you know, for vacation. They're stuck in the field, and if this field's bare um, and they got no food to eat, they're going to starve to death. And so, keeping the soil covered, ideally cover crops, mulch, whatever it is, keeping food for the microbes at all, all 12 months of the year is, is a really important piece of the puzzle. Um, similarly, they you know, microbes like to breathe air. And so when your soil is really tight, um, they'll asphyxiate, they'll die of lack of lack of air to breathe. And so, you know, managing your soils in such a fashion to facilitate that aeration, you know, the minimal disturbance, the polycultures, there's all kinds of techniques, you know, air to breathe, food to eat, water to drink, most microbes are living organisms. Most organisms need water to drink. <laughs> if the soil's dry, they are not, they, they don't function and the, and the plants stop functioning. So, you know, maintaining a system to, or, or maintaining a system that facilitates hydration, you know, depending on what your scale is, logistics, et cetera, you know, being able to maintain hydration in those periods of, of drought is yeah, of systemic import. Um, and then, um, I like to talk about minerals too. Not a lot of people talk about minerals, but um, you know, in biochemistry, we have these things called enzymes and vitamins, and um, you know, enzymes are used like sockets and wrenches to put things together or take things apart. If you're building a protein or building a carbohydrate or digesting a you know a protein, whatever it is, um, you need enzymes to do that, uh, whether in the microbe or in the plant or in the animal. And those enzymes have different elements at their core, so. There's copper-based enzymes and zinc-based enzymes and chromium-based enzymes and cobalt-based enzymes. And um, if you don't have some of those necessary elements present in the environment, then um, all other all things may be, may, may be good. You've got air, you've got water, you've got food, but you don't have any cobalt. Well, you don't have cobalt, you don't have B12, you don't have B12, you don't have 80% of the species of soil life. Mm. You don't have humans. Um, so Dan, do the minerals... Um... How, like so specifically, how do the minerals impact that soil life? Are they giving... they're critical for them to exist? So, so for example, so can they be there but be dormant if the minerals aren't there? Um, you've heard about B twelve, perhaps. 
Um, you know, vegans and vegetarians are told that they need to get a, 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 a B12 supplement sometimes mm -hmm. by their you know, practitioners or health practitioners because there's not enough B12 in their plant-based diet. Um, B12 is a compound that has one atom of cobalt at the center of it. Um, the other components of the compound are amino acids, which are generally not in short supply. Um, if you don't have enough B12 in your body, you become anemic, lethargic, and finally, you really don't have enough, you become dead, right? You you need a certain amount of B12 in your body to exist. And that's just, you You are a cobalt dependent organism. A certain amount of cobalt is necessary in your system for you to live. If it's not there, you don't, you're not alive. So um, I use the example of taking an airplane full of people and dropping it off in the center of Alaska in the middle of the winter um, and flying away, you know, like you can add inoculants, you can add microbes to an ecosystem, but if the ecosystem does not have present what these <laughs> those microbes need to need to function, they're going to die. You know, when the first pilgrims came over, you know, and the Mayflower and things, <laughs> a lot of them didn't make it through the winter because um, they didn't know what they were doing. Um, they didn't have they didn't have they didn't have a home. They didn't have logistics. So yeah, minerals are one of those key logistics where you know it's just experiment with it and you know just try spreading some here and don't spend some there and and uh, you see things happen that are really impressive um that was one of my biggest awakenings as an organic farmer 20 plus years into it was reading about this stuff and experimenting with some rock dust and saying oh my god <laughs> a why have i never heard about this and b what the hell's going on this is amazing yeah what are your favorite ways to get minerals into the soil um, with a five gallon bucket under my arm and my hand going like this <laughs> sort of <laughs> with rock dust and what else, what else broadcasting them out there. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, rock dust of various sorts, basaltics are generally beneficial. All these comments are of course, site context dependent. So you can't mm -hmm. ever say anything's appropriate for every, anything's appropriate for everyone. Um, so yeah, rock dust is generally quite beneficial, generally extremely inexpensive, um, Sea salt is great, you know, at smaller quantities, but oftentimes also very, very beneficial. <clears throat> um, I use, uh, I mean, I can green sand and rock phosphate and carbonatite and humates and there's a various, um, depending on if you take a soil test and you understand like, okay, boron deficiency is quite significant. I'll add some borax or some solubor, um, you know, cobalt sulfate for cobate, cobalt manganese sulfate for manganese. Um, you know, depending on how, how dialed in you want to get, either in the sort of intellectual, logical science framework or the intuitive, you know, just talk to your plants and ask them what they want framework, um, you can you can go um, certainly down a rabbit hole with minerals. Yeah, super uh, fascinating. I'm so glad you touched on that. Um, <clears throat> so keep your soil covered. Um, keep the microbes fed. Keeping the microbes fed. fed. Fed, fed watered um, with uh, <laughs> air, air to breathe um, and some basic minerals to build their bodies out of, uh, which are all pretty rudimentary, right? Actually, and then, you know, making sure the microbes are there to begin with, because in many cases, we've got environmental conditions where um, through historical dynamics, toxins, pollution, whatever, whatever, whole families of organisms, organisms are no longer present in your soil. So, so how do we get them there if they're none? If they're not there, uh, you inoculate, you 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 re reestablish them. Um, there's lots of different ways of getting inoculants. You can harvest them from your local ecosystem. You can make ferments. You can buy, you know, spores in a jar. Um, I'm, I'm not dogmatic about what you do, um, but understand the concept that a full spectrum of species must be there for that, you know, um, <clears throat> Bottom of the food right. really well. Is that where um, indigenous microorganisms and compost teas and would come in to green natural farming and and certainly there's all kinds of yeah um, soil food web um, yeah. um, you know lots of lots of companies sell powdered inoculants you know there's some really good products in the market that are quite inexpensive um, so yeah it's really exciting because 10 years ago this is a topic that almost no one even had heard of the word and now it's like a absolutely burgeoning ecosystem of all kinds of you know turf battles and like yeah our inoculants are better and our philosophy and you got to use our techniques and like great look at this a whole bunch of people like actively involved in this process and yeah. 
It's yeah. exciting. It's really exciting. So Dan, why is this work so important to you? Why? Can, let me ask you that again. Yeah. Why is why is the nutrient density of food so important to you? Um, well, uh, I guess as far as I'm concerned, if, um, if our food was more nutritious, if, if the mission of the BFA, the organization that I run is accomplished, that, you know, food is of higher caliber, you know, we've increased quality of the food supply, um, that is going to have a series of, of, you know, interrelated effects. You know, one is people overall will be healthier, um, lessened levels of chronic disease, lessened needs for, um, you know, medical costs and, you know, that major drain on the, on the culture and people's pocketbooks, et cetera. Um, we're going to have a environment that is systemically healthier, you know, um, you know, a dramatic obviation removal of the agrochemicals. Um, it's really quite quite difficult, if not impossible, to produce high quality food in the presence of toxins um, and with fertilizers. Right, the fertilizers and toxins grow volume, but they don't grow quality. And so, if you actually have the food supply <clears throat> in a place where it's built, it's made of high quality food. <clears throat> then you can't have being used all these things <laughs> and you will have to treat the soil in such a way that it's actually going to be covered and alive and building soil carbon. And so you're going to have, you know, the dead zone in the, in the um, Caribbean gone and, um, you know, climate balancing occurring. Um, I, you know, if, if we do food well, a lot of things come together around it. And I would argue more broadly, if people are healthier, are more coherent, um, they're more functional, more capable of being centered and harmonious in their lives. Um, I would say, you know, from a personal standpoint, I think, um, I mean, as I understand the physics of it all, there's a vast majority of the universe is in a format that the scientists can't find, right? This thing called dark matter and dark energy happens to be, at least from what they think right now, about 95% of reality. And that means dark means they can't find it like <laughs> all the telescopes and microscopes and the spectrometers and everything else like they can't find 95 percent of reality um the western scientists the um i would say we have a science of the east um which is perhaps quite older and focuses more on the subtler aspects the metaphysics uh the internal reality um um and yeah, I mean, I, I actually got into university originally as a musician, um, and so the, I use a metaphor of music to explain this point that, you know, you've got a piano keyboard, and you've got maybe eight octaves on that piano keyboard, and there's a low, low C, and then there's low C, and then there's C, and there's high C, and high, high C, it's just like, just, it's all C, but it's an, they're octaves, and so, um, yeah, from a personal standpoint, you know, my my supposition is that the physical plane is, you know, one octave of reality, and there's other octaves, Um there's your energy body, your emotional body, your mental body, your spiritual body, there's chakras, and there's all kinds of aspects of ourselves um, that I think are, it's all vibrational. So like, I mean, I guess basically what it comes down to me is like, if your body is vibrating coherently, vibrating in tune, then it's easier for you to tune into your higher nature. Um, and if you're vibrating out of tune, if you're dissonant, if you're groggy, if you're, I mean, think about like DNA, People think about DNA as a compound, whatever, it's squ squirrely squig or whatever. But, you know, it's a compound in chemistry, but it's a vibration in physics. Um, every atom of copper is actually a vibration. Every atom of you know, hydrogen is a vibration. And so DNA is all those vibrations vibrating together. It actually is like a resonant note or, or a chord. And so um, if you're... If your DNA is not able to replicate properly because the environmental conditions of your body are such that you don't have the chromium in your diet that your DNA needs to replicate as you know one of the chromium based enzymes is there to put this piece of DNA together functionally you know nutritional deficiencies correlate with these biochemical breakdowns and markers um, genetic markers and you can think about a genetic marker as a break, you know, in a chain of a, of a series of things, but you can also think of it as, as a dissonance. I think of it like as a elementary school band concert. 
if you've ever been to an elementary school band concert and you know what that sounds like, you know, it's so sweet, so cute, but damn, it just kind of grates on you, you know, that vibration is dissonance, is out of tune. <clears throat> you have a hard time hearing the harmonics, the overtones, you know, in that environment. Whereas if you're in a beautiful a cappella choir singing perfectly in tune, four voices, five notes are heard, you know, it's called an overtone, a higher octave manifests when the lower octave is perfectly in tune. And so for me, like if the physical plane is one octave of reality, the more we can get our physical plane in tune, the more we can have the overtones of consciousness be grounded and maintained in our day-to-day -day existence. And so, you know, if you look broadly at the culture and you look at the dysfunction in the economic system and the political system and the media system and the education system and the health system and the agriculture system, where do you want to look and you, and you can find, you know, dysfunction. And I would say, instead of fighting I'm going to be, a, I'm going to be a political activist, you know, I'm going to, you know, fight for economic justice. I'm going to fight for environmental, you know, resilience. Um, you know, I would say that all these things are happening that are happening are built out of humans, right? There's humans in the economic system, there's humans in the education system, there's humans in the, you know, agriculture system. And, you know, my thought is the more we are healed ourselves, the more our effects in the world are healing. And so instead of trying to fight problems, to me, it's like, how can we build solutions? And I think as we become more coherent by eating food that is more coherent, we have that effect in the world around us. And so I call it a spiritual covert op. Um, I think strategically, we're trying to raise consciousness and, um, and this just seems the way the way my mind works like a, a practical thing to do and some way that one person can have an effect so that was a long rambling answer to your question but perhaps i got to <laughs> something yeah about some i just want to say uh i man deep gratitude to you dan and uh i i deeply personally resonate with what you said and um and and you know the underlying and I would say the umbrella and the container of heart and soul is to really be a part of that global awakening and beautiful and and the rising of consciousness collectively and together through the foods that we eat and how we grow our food. Because I I share that yeah I share that um, that connection with our food and how and the incredibly important role it plays not just for us nutritionally but also environmentally and our interaction with the earth, our home and with each other. So I'm curious, what has been your own personal observation or experience in your healing and in your awareness around the impact of eating nutrient dense food in your own personal journey? Um, when I uh, eat well. I, you know, my, my subtle senses are much more functional. Uh, I was, uh, I was sitting out in the back porch a couple of days ago and uh, it was dusk and I could, I could swear I was seeing like, I don't know. I was, um, it's, it was like, it was like mist or, or breath, you know, like you can see maybe like um, in the, on a cold day, you can see, you can see your breath, but it was, it was 70 degrees out. And it was just like, I could just, I could almost see the it was like waves of prana flowing. It was really, really interesting. Um, eyes wide open, you know, third eye was totally pounding or whatever activated, but um, yeah, I don't know. I think, I think we all are wired with the capacity to perceive on multiple levels and cultures globally tell us this, right? It's just our Western culture, which tells us we only have five senses and they're all physical. Um, so um, yeah, my experience is the more you're like on the land and barefoot and out, out of Wi-Fi and not in a stressful <laughs> energy and taking care of yourself, the deeper your experiences of life are. It certainly helps to be and living in as much of a harmony with nature as possible. Absolutely. More and more people are awakening to the impact of the food that they eat and the health that they have and on the environment yes. on which we live. Yeah. And so I'm curious, <clears throat> how do you see that impacting farmers economically and where they are today and what they need to wake up to 
now in order to be uh, a part of people waking up to the importance of nutrient density? Yeah, well, I mean, I think, <clears throat> unfortunately, there's a big, a big space between the farmer and the consumer in the dominant supply chain, at least here in, you know, in the US and a lot of developed world. Um, developed. <laughs> How pretentious can we get? Um, yeah, you know, a lot of the things that are on the shelf um, that people call food, I would call junk. Um, and, you know, there's this thing called junk food, I would say it can either be junk or it can be food, but really, you know, it's like, you know, let's, 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 let's call a spade a spade. Um, you can take any brown rice grown well or poorly and cook it and eat it. And you'll have a much better health effect than if you take white rice and cook it and eat it because you've taken a bunch of the nutrients off the rice before you cooked it and ate it. And so, you know, there's all kinds of bars out there that have protein powder or have fiber. No, you know, it's like, it's a highly processed product that's got something which fits under the structure that the companies have built and told the government to sign that meets the metrics and they can use to market. But foundationally, it's not food. It's not. And so, I mean, it, it, it may maintain, it may sustain you, but it does not, you know, rejuvenate you. And I would say, you know, the foundational thing is really like, I think Michael Pollan said it, if your grandmother wouldn't recognize it, it's not food. And maybe now it has to be my great grandmother because, you know, some people have grandmothers that were alive in the fifties and saw Crisco and margarine and thought that was food. So, you know, before we started industrially, you know, processing food into these products, um, you know, you had a, a much better foundation. And so, I mean, that's a big piece of it right there. And, um, you know, what do they say, you know, walk around the outside of the aisle, outside of the grocery store, don't, don't go in the, don't go in the aisles. Um, I would say it's almost impossible to buy good food. So if you aren't growing your food, you're going to have a hard time getting quality. It, you can do it. I mean, you've local CSAs and I mean, you, if you're really a really active, proactive and you're, act, you know, you're getting all your different, different ingredients, um, you can do a good job, but it's definitely a difficulty. Um, so yeah, I think, I mean, that's one piece. I think that's not where you were going with your question. You know, the, the, I think the question was more about the farmers and, um, you know, should this be a burgeoning movement? You know, how can farmers get on board? Um, um, you know, I think strategically with where we're at with this whole process of nutrient density, which I haven't really talked a lot about the science here yet so far, um, we're, we're at the point of um, <clears throat> doing the, the deep, heavy, expensive science to define terms and to be able to say categorically, this steak is better, this steak is decent, this steak is worse based on hundreds of compounds, levels and ratios, not just a simple little, you know, eight thing side pack, um, overlaying the, 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 the compounds in the beef with the microbiome of the animals, with the soil metrics, with the management practices, with the forage, and really, you know, trying to find that point where the overlaps occurred, it looks like, you know, from a microbiological perspective, this is a healthy animal. From a biochemical perspective, these are the compounds that are in place from a, you know, and like, and really can we begin to, if we're going to use science, if we're going to be Western rational scientists and we're going to do, use the, those tools, let's do it thoughtfully. Let's see if we can understand nature's pattern and, and work to, you know, amplify that as opposed to come in with our, our um, in many cases, profit, profit-centered agendas. Um, mm. so. so what I'm hearing first is grow your own food when you can, right? And then secondly, and without chemicals, of course, and, and uh, mindfully keep your soil covered and doing all that. If you're not that kind of person or you don't have access to land, there are, you know, farmers markets and there are CSAs and I mean, there are buying clubs. I mean, there, yeah. not everybody can grow food based on the logistics of their reality. So, you know, um, I, I would say the quality of your food should be a priority, you know, in your life. And if you're, you know, which season of, you know, which show on, I don't know, which streaming platform is a higher priority, then that's just where you're at. And, you know, I think we have to just choose 
um, choose to prioritize the quality of your food. That would be the thing. And growing is great. It's a great experience. Right. And, and I guess, yeah. and I want to talk to you more about the science and how to measure, how you're measuring yeah. the nutrients of food and um before we do though i want to know what's at stake for farmers if they don't get on board with an understanding of yeah. the f- nutritional value of the food that they're growing right so that was what i was sort of driving to was you know yeah. until we can say this beef is good this beef is decent this beef is bad we can't have an economic incentive for the farmers, which inspires them to focus on producing quality instead of volume. Mm. And so that's really where we're at right now is like, yes, nutrients vary massively. Yes, the nutrient variation connects quite well with soil health and management practices. Yes, we can build little sensors to flash a light at a thing and get a reading in real time. So you don't have to trust a label or trust some certification system that you have the tool in your hand to go and test it. That's a possibility. So we can bring transparency in real time for assessment for anybody to the supply chain. Um, And now it's about defining that quality. And so, you know, to my mind, the growers that are doing a good job now, as we begin to have that empirical verification of the quality they're producing are going to be offered premiums. And those who are not, um, are not. And so the way I see this going down and, you know, two years, five years, depending on which crop it is we're talking about, um, is say there's a bunch of strawberry growers in California um, and there's a packing house and the packing house gets orders for, you know, I don't know, eight truckloads a day and the producers have 10 truckloads a day of available to bring in to the packing house to wash and pack. And, um, and the, and the backing house says, well, you know, we're, beep, beep, you're good, beep, beep, you're good, beep, beep, you're good, beep, beep, we don't want your stuff. Or beep, beep, here's a 20% premium, beep, beep, here's a 15% premium, beep, beep, here's your, here's a normal price, beep, beep, here's a 20% deficit. My thought is, you know, there's, because of the powerful connections between nutrient levels and human health and the connections between chronic disease and all the other, you know, dynamics that are occurring broadly in the culture, I think we're going to have more and more interest in that basic level of quality being a thing that people are are paying for. You know, I can see the the federal government only up allowing food to be, you know, brought into schools for make for school lunches if it passes a certain caliber, for instance. Mm-hmm. Um so that be something. Um I mean WIC cards and and uh, EBT cards and um you know um yeah we, there's all kinds of opportunities to organize around a solution. And so I don't think it's all going to come down in one big fell swoop. It's like not all going to change immediately. Right. And maybe the climate change is going to be a faster one in agenda because I mean, I was just talking to a really big, um, you know, company that makes French fries and, and things like that. And they're like, we supply, we, we source from five different regions planet wide. Um, and our business plan involves there being a cataclysmic crop failure in one of those five regions every year. And the reality is it's two of the five regions every year are having a cataclysmic crop failure because of the climate dynamics, et cetera. So, um, I mean, the more we wear out the earth, the less well things grow. So, <laughs> I mean, we can turn around pretty fast. If we, if, if, we, if we change your practices, nature's right there. Nature will work with you. But if you've been beating her up for, for long enough, at some point, she's just gonna, you know, mm. it doesn't do well, so. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I don't know, those are <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, what's short, coming, think response, but <laughs> no, they're great. This this is awesome, Dan. What's coming up for me right now is um, we often wonder about how how we can you know bring our friends or bring our family on on board or bring them onto the train with us, and and it it just hits home so profoundly that sharing our food that we grow or that we get from or the farmers market or from the farmer that we know is probably the most powerful, impactful way to do it because then they get to experience the taste and the energy and the experience of eating that really good food. I think, I think the human connection, it's not just the food, it's the, it's the way you cook it and who you eat it with and, and what yes. the mood is you eat it with. I mean, how do the Italians do it? You know, sit down for lunch at 12 and get up at two and then go take a nap and everybody's hung out and had a bottle of wine and everybody's, you know, happy. And like, 
what are we doing here in the first place? Like, what's the whole point of life? You know, is it just to constantly rush around all the time or actually to enjoy ourselves and be happy and enjoy each other? And I, I, I don't know, I think, mm. um, but yeah, then you have got jobs and you got debts and you got your mortgage and you got your, you know, you're plugged into this, you know, it's the matrix really, you're plugged into the matrix. And, yeah. and how do you, how do you disengage from that? Because I think that's really what it comes down to is take is a little more, more about autonomy in your life and um and that's a that's a that's a real challenge that's mm -hmm. a real challenge um but doable if you focus on it um what makes it doable yeah. for you what parts of it the unplugging from the system mm -hmm. um i mean i feel like i've done it to some decent degree but <laughs> i mean I, I i have tons of privilege you know i grew up on a farm and i'm a white male and you know, I've got a reasonable intelligence and 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 good family background, so I've got a lot of I've got a lot of certainly a lot of privilege. But um, you know, I mean, land does not cost that much in a lot of places. Yeah. It's two grand an acre, five grand an acre, ten grand an acre. You know, it's it, if if you if if it's really important for you to buy land, um, to be on land, I think people, you know, because housing is so ridiculously expensive these days. Right. I mean, living in an urban area, living in a developed area, you're in for hundreds of thousands of dollars at least. And and then you got to work this job and you got to do a high paying job. And then you got to the only people that are paying high are, are people are doing things that aren't quite ethical. And then you got to, you know, there's all these other conflicting dynamics. And I would say, like, I mean, the back to the land movement, I guess, is something that was, you know, a thing in the 60s and 70s. My parents basically did that in the early 80s. They we're living in inner city Boston and basically bought a piece of land on a dirt road and built a house and started a homestead, um, root cellar and milk cow and the whole thing. Um, and chose a simpler lifestyle and didn't have a whole lot of money, but, you know, certainly have their autonomy and their independence. And, um, I don't know. I, I think, I think it's a really, there's a, you know, I, I, I occupy the land is one of my, is one of my sort of little lines, like, what are you going to do? I mean, it, you can, the, as, as long as you're putting your energy into the system, you are feeding the system. Mm -hmm. Whenever you buy food that comes from the industrial paradigm, you are supporting the industrial paradigm. You can get on your high horse and you can complain and you can get all protesting and all kinds of stuff. But, you know, I mean, like <laughs> where we put our energy is where our energy goes. And if we want a different reality, then we got to figure out a way to take responsibility for as much of our life as possible. Um, and food's a great thing because if you track food down all the way, um, it's going to pull you out. <laughs> um, Amen to that. So powerful. Um, one of, uh, one of the pieces that you are well known for, and one of the reasons that I want to have a conversation with you is about how you're measuring the nutrient density in food. So can you just, uh, walk us through that and where it is right now. And you touched yes. on a little bit about where it's going, but um, just if you could summarize that for us, that'd be great. Yeah. So, um, so, I mean, this whole thing started, I would say probably 2005, 2006. Um, I just gotten married and had no uh, viable skill sets besides farming. I basically had been managing my parents' farm in the summer and traveling the world in the winter. And, um, <clears throat> making enough money working, you know, 20 hours a week, seven bucks an hour, like six months of the year to, you know, like, that's fine. I can, I can travel the world in the winter, uh, live for cheap. I don't need much. And then I was like, Oh God, I'm married. I got to have a family. I got to be responsible, make a living. And I, all I knew how to do was farm. And, um, that was when I came to the realization that, you know, um, being eaten alive by flesh eating fungus is not a sign of good health. And being, being eaten alive by larvae is also not a sign of good health. And that was, what was happening to a lot of my crops. And I was like, so if I'm got on my high horse because I'm organic, but my plants are being eaten alive, maybe there's more to it than just not using chemicals. And so I went to, I started reading books and going to conferences. I went to this um, group called Acres USA. They had an annual conference and um, there was this conversation there about bricks. And um, I was like, what's bricks? And like, it's this little thing where you can squeeze the leaf or get a drop of juice out of the leaf or a drop of juice out of the carrot or whatever. And you can see, and it'll tell you how good things are. I'm like, what are you talking about? Um, 
And it's, you know, it's about 190 years old. It's nothing new. And there's a really inexpensive thing you can use to test it. And it really correlates with plant health and with flavor and shelf life and, you know, all kinds of things. It's like, and I was like, this is amazing. There's the variation in food and, it, and it, just because plants are green doesn't mean they're healthy and you can test it and you can proactively support that. I was blown away. I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. Why did I never learn anything about this? Um, but as I got to keep talking more and more, and you know, learning from talking and just practicing, and I was like, where is the organization that's like educating about this? Where is the movement around this? This whole thing seems really important. You know, is organic better? Well, some organic is good and some organic is not good. You know, is regenerative better? Some regenerative is good and some regenerative is not good. Permaculture, local, you know, farmer's market, grocery store, some's good, some's not good. It's not all uniform. And it's not like organic is better and grocery store is worse. It's, it's you know, it's not like Whole Foods is better and Walmart's worse. <laughs> you know, it's not, it's not. It's really not. It's like, it's how each thing was grown connects to how good it is. And there's a continuum there. So anyway, long story, um, got to thinking this is really exciting and important and started giving workshops and that turned into an organization and that turned into, you know, courses and a conference and things like that. And, you know, we were basically started giving these courses around the country and in other countries. Um, and it was, people would, you know, here in the Northeast or in the Southeast or in the Midwest or in the Mountain West or in all the way West or wherever it was, different climate zones, different crops, different scales, and these basic principles of like microbes need air to breathe and water to drink and food to eat and things like that was applicable. It worked. Didn't matter where you were, you know, managing your ecosystem to accomplish those things was connecting with better yields, better pest and disease resistance, better flavor, better soil health. And <clears throat> I was like, if this is true, if this is really true, that working with nature in such a way could systemically address a whole bunch of apparently existential issues like we sh there should be some movement around it we should be building a momentum and, and like a strategy and like how do we bring this to scale basically you know how do we scale this because this is potentially quite exciting um i spent my 20s being an activist you know fighting against gmos and doing political work and all kinds of different things um and and i you know it seemed like fighting against problems was not a winning strategy um, and so, um, yeah, so the basic idea was give people the ability to choose the food they eat based on its inherent nutritional quality. And so if you've got three bags of carrots in the grocery store shelves, you got a, a bunny love and a cal organic and a, and a, you know, um, both house farms bag of carrots, and they're all in a buck 15, two bucks a pound or whatever they are, which one do you choose? And I would say, if you had a little meter, you could flash the light at the bunny love and it said 20 out of 100. And you could flash the light at the Cal Organic, it said 40 out of 100. And you flash the light at the Bolt House Farm, it says 80 out of 100. You're probably going to take the Bolt House Farms. And, you know, next week, it may be Cal Organic is better because they're getting their carrots from a different farm. And so if we could give consumers the ability to choose the food they're purchasing based on its quality, that would apply an economic incentive which today's world seems to work on money to some large degree to the whole supply chain to focus on quality instead of volume and that's the basic idea and so um <clears throat> how would we do that i mean there's been a few steps it's been a few years now we've been working on this it's been an absolute total pain in the butt engineering instruments building labs getting writing code you know <clears throat> I mean, it's not fun, <laughs> but but if we can pull it off, if we can establish a foundational framework where like we know what good and bad and everything in the middle are, and we've got an instrument that's calibrated that anybody can use that is shifting the way things are done around the world, then it's totally worth it. And so um, effectively, we started in 2017 with the project. Um, th this is the second generation of the meter I've got here. It's, it's not much more than the first generation, but um, this is calibrated to 10 crops and it's out in the hands of hundreds of people around the world. And you can take it and flash light at a carrot and get a reading back on your smartphone or flash light at wheat berries or at mustard greens or whatever, zucchini. Um, and so, yeah, the basic idea was, you know, identify that the variation is there, significant, connected to manage, management practice and soil health. These were hypotheses. We hypothesized that nutrient variations were significant and they connected to soil management, soil health and management practices. 
And we hypothesized that you could build a handheld consumer priced open source flash of light meter that could test nutrient variations. Those were our, I was like, if it's true the nutrients vary significantly because the data out there basically doesn't exist. If it's true those nutrient variations connect to management practices and soil health because the data's not there, doesn't exist. If it's true we can build a handheld meter that a consumer can afford to test quality. If those three things are true, then we think we've got a strategy that could profoundly shift reality. You know, um, it would be a, a proper disruptor for agriculture. Um, and so as of 2021, we basically completed that proof of concept. We set up labs in multiple countries, worked with hundreds of farms, sent, got thousands of samples sent in, soil, then management data, dozens of crops. Yeah, nutrients vary dramatically. 2X, 3X, 5X, 10X, 25X. Like this carrot has as much calcium as those three carrots. <clears throat> this leaf of spinach has as much iron as those 15 leaves of iron. spinach. This, I think, yeah, I mean, it's 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 not small. It's not 2%, 5%, 10%. It's 2X, 5X, 10X variations. Amazing. What we've so, found. so the beginner step is is uh, is using the BRICS test to... That's probably the, still the best meter we've got for right. universal uses. And so you, you are taking that one step further, which is the bionutrient meter. And so right yes. now we, have, we actually have to get on a wait list to get the next iteration of it. It's going right? to be a long wait. It's going to be a long wait. <laughs> I'm feeling the pain. Um, but well, the, very, the fact very that, exciting. And, um, and, uh, yeah. and it's open source, which I love. And people can support you. People can support the evolution of this by mm -hmm. uh, by becoming a member or supporter of the initiative, right? Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, we're a nonprofit educational organization. Everything we do is in the commons. Everything's open source. We're not a company. Um, <clears throat> we're specifically building this thing and putting the specs online for anybody else to be able to build if they want to. We don't own it. It's copy left, not copyright, which means it belongs to everyone, not belongs yeah. to someone. Yeah. And yeah. That's our concept is like, if we figure this thing out in the public and we have a definition of quality that everyone understands, then let the companies get in and make all kinds of money competing with each other to provide better quality. Go for it. Because that's yes. the way the world works. But there has to be an honest foundation to the science up upon which everyone's competing. And that's yes. what we're doing. Yes, yes. Um, and forgive me, is it bonnutrient.org? Uh, there's two websites. Bionutrient.org is the general sort of education um, community uh, site. And then there's a the bionutrientinstitute.org, which is where all the science and the reports and labs and things like that occurs. Right. So, uh, so be sure to go and check that out and get yourself a membership at some level. So <laughs> all support. Much appreciated. Yes. Yeah. Support Dan on his mission because it's not just a mission. It's not, it's so far beyond a personal mission it's a global mission for the earth and the planet and humanity and all we share it with collectively uh, one last question dan be mindful of the time looking ahead what are some of your aspirations and visions of where we are now and where we can go with the understanding of nutrient density and our connection to food and each other uh, aspirations and visions, is that what it was? Um, grand visions or, or, or practical visions? Whatever you like. Any number of grand visions. Uh, the logistics of pulling things off is uh, always, a, <laughs> always a humbling, a humbling factor. Um, boy, yeah, I, mean, I think I've covered a lot of the pieces already. I, I mean, I think, um, I mean, you could argue that there's a, a, a pretty, an existential, <laughs> existential moment we're in culturally with the environment, with the politics, with the any number of things, health, you know, I mean, different people probably have three or four or five different topic areas that they're inflamed about right now. And, you know, I think when you get out of harmony with nature, I mean, you either find a way to get back in harmony or you die. And that's the way it works. Nature, this is, nature's who's in charge. And the more we're out of tune with nature, um, the more we fall apart and die. And, and so it feels like to me, our culture, our bodies, you know, at, uh, you know, we've gotten, we've gotten reasonably far away from nature. And so, um, <clears throat> and we're, we're struggling, we're struggling um, in all kinds of different ways. And I think um, 
it doesn't have to be that way. Sometimes you need to have a little bit of pain to, to you know, change your actions, to straighten up. Um, and so, you know, I see in this opportunity, you know, one of, of you know, uh, well, this dynamic, a significant opportunity, let's say it that way. And I think, um, you know, what are the pathways forward? How can we practically engage in a meaningful fashion? If you're concerned about the climate, for instance, like you can worry about your kids and everything else, but like, God, what can you do about the climate? Well, if you eat good food, you are having a direct positive impact on the climate, right? I mean, seriously, if we like that about light bulbs and getting Priuses and stuff like that, like if you just ate good food, food of high nutritional caliber, um, and everyone around you did, that would take care of the climate in short order. Um, that would, that would, I mean, there's, so all these things are beautifully interrelated. Um, and it's just, I think primarily about finding, um, solutions to be building as opposed to problems to be fighting. I think that's one of the biggest, biggest pieces, um, I've learned is like where you put your energy is where your energy goes. You put your energy towards a problem. You're just amplifying that problem. If, you know, let's, Let's work towards solutions. And I think food is just, I mean, a really foundational one. So um, there we go. Thank you for that. Awesome. You're amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time today. I appreciate you. My pleasure. My total pleasure. Keep up with Dan and follow his incredible work on socials on Facebook at Bionutrient, Instagram at Bionutrient Food Association, on YouTube at Bionutrient Food Association and on the World Wide Web at bionutrient.org. Who knew the nutrient density of food could impact how we feel emotionally, mentally, physically, and even spiritually, impacting the health of our bodies, the health of our children, the health of our friends, and the health of the planet. Everything's connected, absolutely everything and food is a common denominator that we all share and is one of the quickest ways that we can make an impact on our health and it's one of the quickest ways we can move the needle i'm curious what are you doing to increase the nutrient density of the food that's coming out of your gardens or from the crops that you grow or on the food that you are sharing with your friends and family and putting it into your tummies. You make yourself an amazing day. Thank you so much for joining us at Heart and Soil. Be sure to subscribe if you're finding value from these conversations, share them with your friends. If you haven't subscribed to Heart and Soil Magazine yet, where you get your very own library of regenerative farming, gardening, and living tips, I just want to invite you to hop on over to heartandsoulmagazine.com where you can sign up for a free article and our free newsletter, which we send out about once every week where we give regenerative tips on farming, gardening, and living for your health and the health of the planet. And like Dan said, remember to focus on the solutions and what's going well in your life and watch your world change. Big love. Make yourself an amazing day.